Hey guys, welcome back to Rocket Gyan, my fellow space tubers. And today we are gonna witness something amazing. That's right, we are gonna witness this beautiful and muscular and the most metallic ever uh, rocket launch from the Vandenberg Air Force Space Station. And sadly, this will be the last launch from the West Coast so please 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 just focus on the word west coast because this is the last launch literally from the west coast for the delta 4 heavy this is not the actual last launch of delta 4 heavy because uh, the last launch there are only two left now and the last launch will be in 2024 again carrying the nrol mission so it will be very interesting and uh, yes uh, welcome all uh, to the stream hi ben green welcome and not snack tv welcome to the stream so this this delta 4 heavy i am like so excited whenever this launches because the fireball which it creates is just uh, over the roof i mean uh, we i i just want to witness that fireball and the most you know the the most powerful rocket engine the hydrogen uh, uh, oxygen in rocket engine the ra 68 engine uh, i want to witness that too and uh, everything just comes into conjunction all each other everything just complements each other and such a beautiful liftoff is achieved and we will see that so don't you worry about it but before that uh, we just need to understand this most metallic rockets of all the delta 4 heavy uh, so this delta 4 heavy is uh, uh, like you know it was considered for the orion program also before the sls there was a uh, proposal to use delta 4 heavy instead of sls as a moon rocket and uh, for the test and there was like one uh, launch also where the orion capsule actually sat over the delta 4 heavy rocket and lifted off it off it was just a test but it just uh, never came into existence but yes it was considered although it's a very 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 costly rocket and this is the reason why this is going uh, to expire very soon uh, the vulcan will take over so the delta 4 medium uh, m plus has already expired we know that uh, this is the delta 4 heavy which was still going on uh, this is the exploded view we'll have a look at that but before that just have a look at the uh, payload capacity so here uh, look at that this heavy one the 6.5 tons to geosynchronous orbit not gto geosynchronous 14.2 tons to gto and 28.3 tons to low earth orbit so this is just 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 outstanding you know the payload uh, reserve uh, the capacity of this rocket is just mind blowing so this uh, uh, today they it is carrying the nrol 91 satellite uh, which is around 15 tons 15000 tons uh, 15 tons yes 15 tons sorry not 15000 15 tons uh, yeah so the 15 tons so uh, we don't know where it is going exactly as it is not revealed because again it's a classified mission but uh, we can uh, say that it is kind of going to the uh, gto uh, because that's the pay around the payload capacity <coughs> sorry that's the payload capacity of uh, uh, to gto and uh, yeah uh, we will talk about the nrol 91 or uh, like uh, what's the satellite is all about but before that let's have a look at the rocket so uh, we'll have a look at the rocket here 
and this is how the rocket looks like so we have the first stage run by 3 RS68A engine which you can see in front of you uh, and these engines are just so you the flame which it produces as you know this is a liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen rocket if you don't know i'm telling you right now and uh, uh, from the shuttle era you know this the the hydrolox engines don't have like any color of the flame most probably they are bluish kind of a thing but for this rocket it's red and there is a reason for that uh, we'll have a look at that but uh, yeah this, so this is the rocket which you can see the first uh, uh, stage or the first uh, yeah the, they, they have there are two booster stages which is again uh, having the same configuration as the core stage and uh, there is also one thing which you need to note about this since the fuel capacity is the same for all the three engines for the first stage uh, i mean the booster stages and uh, uh, this this um, and they don't have like you know uh, some asparagus conf configuration which allows if you know if you have played ksp you know what asparagus configuration is it allows the fuel from the boosters uh, uh, stages to run uh, into the core stage and hence an efficient way of flowing of uh, uh, yeah efficient way of flying a rocket so uh, this is not happening here and uh, because of that uh, since everything is same the core for the core stage and the booster stage the amount of the fuel which is depleted per second should also be the same right but if you see the uh, launch sequence and the flight profile you will see the boosters are jettisoned after some time and uh, the reason behind that is that <laughs> they simply just the the thrust of the rocket is just too much the maximum thrust of the rocket is just too much that they had to throttle down the core stage so as to preserve the fuel in it and hence the uh, the booster stages just runs at full thrust and they just jettison when they are depleted uh, of its fuel but the core stage still runs on because it was not at the full thrust and then when the uh, booster stages are jettisoned it comes back to the full thrust and that is how it uh, uh, remains attached uh, even after the boosters have been depleted same phenomena is used in the falcon heavy itself falcon heavy also okay so the yeah the ra 68 engine runs on uh, we'll talk about ra 68 engine so this are the first stage then we have the second stage again this second stage must be looking teeny tiny but is uh the most hands down the most the uh capable upper stage that is flying right now and uh, don't you look at this um, teeny tiny nozzle it's it's so big that you won't even imagine <laughs> like you know i'll show you the pictures also but again this is rl10 engine and also runs on liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen uh all right now let's 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 move on again um uh, i'll show you some pics of the rocket engine itself right so this is the rs68a engine this is the engine which is run on uh, uh, the boosters and uh, this this engine if you see is very shiny on the nozzle and um, yes there is a reason for its shine and that also explains why the 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 plume which comes out of this rocket is red in color so this this is not like sls or the shuttle engines which have those uh, rings going around it if those are missing right and those rings have this uh, uh, function to cool down the rocket nozzle because the fuel the liquid oxygen uh, flows through it and it cools down the liquid uh, this uh, nozzle but here you don't see that because there is no as such regenerative cooling whatever i explained for the shuttle and that the the fuel going through the nozzle that is called regenerative cooling it does not have regenerative cooling it what it has is ablative cooling so this shiny material which you can see in front of you is nothing but a carbon radiator ablator so it's, it's you can say kind of it's not exactly but kind of what is used in heat shield and it when a capsule comes back to the earth so what happens is uh, the fuel burns uh, the ablator it just ablates off and uh, this is mostly carbon so when it uh, uh, that carbon reacts with the plume which is coming out of it and causes the beautiful red looking color of the rocket so yeah <laughs> there's that and notice there are like um, this is one of the sign 
that is a gas generator cycle so it's a gas generator cycle liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen as its fuel and yes this is how it looks like once it is like fully installed on the rocket and yes uh, these are just the cover which is removed before flight okay so i need to show you this amazing uh, uh, ra 68 a config like how it run, runs and everything so this this gas generator as i said this is a gas generator cycle engine which means the fuel first of all the liquid oxygen flows through the turbo pump and some of the fuel uh, turbo pump uh, i'll tell you why that happens because you know this turbo pump is rotated initially so that's why uh, there is a this helium spin line right so this uh, the, the turbo pump is rotated initially and that is the reason why it flows through the turbo pump first then it goes into the this uh, uh, gas generator oxidizer valve same happens in the fuel line also uh, the fuel uh, the fuel goes through the uh, again the gas generator fuel valve this is the gas generator this generates the gas this this generates the pressure then that pressure is fed to the turbo pump which you can see which uh, which which rotates the turbo pump even faster so that the rocket can sustain flight i won't explain you the cycle itself but what what i wanted to explain you is that uh, see this this is a the 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 exhaust coming out of the rocket this is a heat exchanger this is no uh, used for heat exchanger which means the all some of the liquid oxygen which is coming out here you can see is fed again back to for the tank pressurization so uh, the liquid oxygen here is uh, turned into the gas and then some of that uh, yeah all of that obviously liquid oxygen is used for that gaseous oxygen is used for the tank pressurization of the uh, tank uh, the fuel tank so there's that uh, and the other one is used for the roll control of the rocket so it's not like they are totally wasting it uh, uh, wasting the the gas generator the open cycle which they have but they have a clever design to have two tasks accomplished uh, this one the liquid oxygen uh, means the tank pressurization as well as the roll control so i just uh, i wanted to show you this and yeah there's that now moving on to the rl10 so this is the rl10 rocket engine and yes this is a liquid hydrogen oxygen closed cycle engine so that's why you can't see any exhaust coming out of it but this is just a small engine looks like a very um, it's look like a shuttle a shuttle type of engine right but let me just give you something <laughs> the the picture which you just saw does not have that nozzle that expanded nozzle the expandable nozzle here you can see this is the uh, picture which shows how the uh, rocket is this engine is stored for the launch configuration because the the nozzle is just so big that it can't fit into the interstage it would be very very long if they made that uh, uh, big of a rocket nozzle that is the reason why this they stored they they have this rl10 engine in this config and uh, once it is used for the ignition and once the engine ignites it becomes like this so whatever you just saw was this part only you know the first image which i show uh, of you of you uh, for this engine and the, the the rocket just you know the nozzle expands twice 2.5 almost 2.5 of its size and just see that massive rocket engine nozzle and it's very uh, advantageous in vacuum because uh, one of the principle for the rocket engine and exhaust and efficiency is that the pressure around the, uh, the surrounding the rocket nozzle and the exhaust pressure should be equal if they are equal then the most efficient propulsion would be achieved and uh, in a vacuum you want your uh, um, rocket to have like the plumes to have like uh, surrounding temperature surrounding pressure and that can only happen once if you have a, a very big nozzle so um yeah there's that so um yep i guess that should cover for uh, the explanation part of this yeah i need to talk about the nrl nrol 91 uh, so this this uh, one is uh, let me just tell you like what this is so this is a classified mission which you know and this is supposed to be the part of uh, the NRO's uh, Keyhole 11 constellation. This is this constellation is nothing but an electro optical digital imaging constellation that provides real time observation to the US government. And this is nothing but you can say kind of Hubble Space Telescope 
pointed towards the earth so you can imagine the amount of resolution it will be having and it will feed directly real time observation to us government and that's why there's a constellation going on although we don't know where these uh, rockets go where these these satellites go so um, yeah there's that but since it's launching from the Vandenberg some sort of expert uh, you know things can be expected so uh, each satellite is supposed to have a 2.4 meter uh, mirror same size as the Hubble and uh, the resolution of around 0.15 meters of the ground which is mind-blowing so um, yeah, this is all about the rocket engine and every um, the uh, rocket engine, rocket and satellite. Let me just see if we have the broadcast. We're still waiting for it. Okay. Um, yeah. So if you have anything, you can ask me right now. The good time. So let me just have it playing over it. Yeah so uh hey everyone so um hi a blue traveler hi baba yada jessica welcome to the stream andrew 10 from italy and i'm very excited american america's Nav america's navigator okay uh hi tony brooks and yes uh you know this this is a moment to be excited because this this rocket itself is like so so powerful so amazing the fireball phenomena which happens okay let me explain you uh, a, a bit or two about fireball uh, since the stream starts so this fireball thing which you will witness today is very peculiar and very unique to delta for heavy only so literally what happens is rocket this delta for heavy rocket catches lit lights itself on fire not catches i would say lights itself on fire literally it lights itself on fire and that is and uh, because of that fire it charges that insulative coating the that orange orange form which it has on the uh, rocket and uh, th this is the reason why most of the time when it lifts off you get to witness a toasty looking rocket and uh, um, the reason why it happens is because it's a hydrogen uh, a rocket, hydro hydrolox rocket. So they what they do is they run this uh, hydrogen through the uh, through the engine for the engine chill, and then they discard it off. And you don't want that since hydrogen is like highly super duper flammable. You uh, you don't want that uh, hydrogen to interact with. Uh, uh, your uh, sorry 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 yeah so hydrogen to interact with your ignition when you ignite the rocket because li it will literally cause a blast that's the amount of hydrogen it, it leaks for uh, during the engine change and that's the reason why uh, the rofies are there uh, which ignites and which causes that excess hydrogen to just go away and that that is the reason why the fireball happens so i guess now the stream has started i'll switch over to that okay yeah At this time, the team is finishing fueling activities. At the request of our customer, we'll end today's live coverage following payload bearing jettison. Before we continue, let's check, check in on today's weather. The Space Launch Dude. Delta 30 forecast is looking good. Here are the numbers. The probability of violating launch constraints is 30%. Ground winds are 10 to 14 knots out of the northwest, and the temperature is 69 degrees Fahrenheit. Visibility is 5 to 7 miles, and the primary concern for today is ground winds. Just look at the quality of the image which we are getting. The weather is looking amazing and the fireball will also look like so damn good uh, today. And I am very very excited for this mission. We are T-minus, almost T-minus 19 minutes from the launch. Uh, things are looking good, as you just heard. National Reconnaissance Office, or NRO. The NRO is the leader in developing, acquiring, launching, and operating the nation's intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance satellites to secure and expand America's advantage in space. 
The NROL-91 mission will strengthen the NRO's ability to provide a wide range of timely intelligence information to the national decision makers, warfighters, and intelligence analysts to protect the nation's vital interests and support humanitarian efforts worldwide. I'm just so excited for this, I can't even tell you. Because there is no fog over there and the weather is amazing. And you will actually witness a toasty looking rocket. Uh, the turbo pump supply valve outlet pressure CVC. The actual toastiness we, you will you can feel today. So um, yeah, that will happen. So uh, right now it's fueling up. Uh, so there is like the let me just explain you the ignition sequence. How does that happen? But I also have made a video for the Delta IV Heavy itself, like explaining how the, the fireball phenomena, the ignition sequence, the the everything about Delta IV Heavy. You can check that out. Uh, you can just search Delta IV Heavy and then my name, um, name of the channel, Rocket Gyan. You will find that video. The, the, the red fl plume and the fireball, the ignition sequence, everything. So, let me talk about this ignition sequence. So at around T minus 15 seconds, the raw fees, which I said are ignited. So those, those raw fees are nothing but radially outward firing igniters. So those are nothing. Those are actually sparkles. Uh, if, if you have seen, um, if remember that shuttle era used to have that sparkle just before the shuttle lift off. And there also the, 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 the reason the function was the same to let off all and the burn all the excess hydrogen 30 seconds pacific let's learn more about this heavy lift rocket the only rocket capable of launching nrol 91 all right built in ula's 1.6 million square foot production facility in decatur alabama the Delta IV Heavy, once fully stacked, stands 233 feet and weighs 1.6 million pounds fully fueled. Three common booster cores, each powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-68A engine, form the first stage. The Delta Cryogenic Second Stage, or DCSS, is powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10 engine. Both stages are fueled with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. The payload is encapsulated inside a protected two-piece composite payload fairing. With production complete, the three boosters, second stage, and payload fairing travel from Alabama to Vandenberg on ULA's rocket ship. Once in California, a series of events lead to today's countdown. The process begins with transporting the rocket from the horizontal integration facility to Space Launch Complex 6, where the fixed pad erector raises the rocket onto the launch table. Next, the payload fairing with the spacecraft already encapsulated is lifted and mated to the center booster. Once fully assembled, final preparations take place, starting with moving the mobile assembly shelter, or MAS, back to its launch position. The MAS protects the Delta IV rocket from the wind and fog, so common to its location here on California's Pacific coast. The launch countdown begins with moving the mobile service tower, or MST. Using 40 hydraulic cylinders at pressures nearing 3,500 PSI, the MST is raised 8 inches and rolled back, revealing the Delta IV launch vehicle. Using a carriage transporter system and traveling at about a quarter mile per hour, it takes about 25 minutes to roll the MST to its launch position, 300 feet east of the rocket. With the MST in its final position, the launch team then transitions to fueling and other final preparations. So here you can see the rocket is not actually rolled to the pad. In fact, uh, uh, the the MST, which is mobile service tower, is ULA's Delta IV Heavy will head back. south from Space Launch Complex Six. Let's take a look at today's flight. To mitigate the fireball created by the hydrogen burning Delta IV Heavy rocket, the staggered engine start sequence begins with ignition of the launch table HBOs, burning off the excess hydrogen injected into the flame duct. Next, the starboard Delta IV Rofi lights ignite its RS 68 This is the thing. Then, the center and port RS 68A engines ignite the 
generate more than 2.1 million pounds of total thrust to lift the 1.6 million pound triple core rocket off the pad. This is not the metal of Shortly all the rockets. Off, I don't know Delta what begins is. begins a pitch over to attain the proper flight path while minimizing the pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. 81 seconds into flight, the Delta IV reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound. With propellant depleted in the port and starboard boosters, the engines shut down and the boosters are jettisoned to shed their weight. The remaining booster engine then throttles to full power to maximize performance against gravity losses. Once propellant levels deplete in the center booster, the engine shuts down. The Delta IV separation system then activates to release the first stage. The vehicle now weighs approximately 7% of what it did at liftoff. Then, the Delta Cryogenic Second Stage, or DCSS, main engine ignites. During ascent, NROL-91 is protected inside a 5-meter diameter payload fairing. After traveling through the densest part of Earth's atmosphere, the payload fairing is jettisoned. The Delta IV Cryogenic Second Stage will carry the payload to its final orbital destination, where it will begin its national security mission. And obviously they will not tell us uh, the whole rocket profile uh, because this is a classified mission, hashtag classified, top no, secret. Minus 44. Okay. So right now we, you can see T minus uh, four minutes and holding it's saying it's, it's a completely nominal thing which they do. So uh, my countdown clock is actually saying to the proper liftoff time. So whatever it's T minus... Uh, and four minutes and holding is a thing which is built into the countdown. So there are like two clocks, clocks T minus four minutes and L minus four minutes. So this T minus four minutes is stopped right now. And then the L is still running right now, which is like, you know, uh, it must be showing T, uh, L minus 11 minutes or something. Once the L minus also uh, comes to at L minus four minutes, then both of the clocks are synced together and then, uh, yeah, the the countdown starts so yeah this has happened hi ashe mahajan i i am here only how I, how about you and yes uh, what was i saying yes uh, the ignition sequence so there there is a staggered engine start for this delta 4 heavy and you just witnessed the fireball which was uh, created in that um, flight profile video you will witness some of that the uniqueness of the this rocket today also with today's launch it's the okay. end of an era here at Vandenberg uh, let Space me Force just... Base, yeah. today's mission is the final West Coast launch of the Delta Heavy rocket. Future ULA missions launching from the West Coast will launch on our new Vulcan rocket, set to make its debut next year. Let's take this time to look back at all the spectacular cliffside launches we experienced from Space Launch Complex 6 here at Vandenberg Space Force Base, California.
<laughs> best video ever i must say that ula has like the best hands down the best pr uh which they can have but still you know uh this this that's the reason why i did not mute the music it was supposed to have such a good feel and rock into it if i have muted the music you wouldn't have got that feel right and i wouldn't want my subscribers and viewers to miss that so yes uh wildflower welcome 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 to the stream uh you are just at the time we are t minus seven minutes from the launch and uh, things are looking pretty good right now so yeah uh as i was explaining the staggered rocket engines ignition sequence so staggered means the boosters the starboards what staggered means staggered actually means staggered only uh like the first of all the starboard side booster is ignited and then the port as well as the center the core is ignited so there is a staggered in, in engine ignition and the reason why they do is to mitigate the excess hydrogen which is there obviously the rofis are doing their job but then also the hydrogen is still there and you don't want the flame to interact uh, the the whole flame to interact with all the hydrogen uh, of all the um, um, the flame coming out of all the engines right that is the reason why the staggered engine start is there so that the first starboard is ignited and then uh, it can just mitigate uh, those hydrogen which is lingering around the rocket so yeah the staggered engine start Patients to teammates who are no longer with us. The NROL 91 mission logo was designed to pay tribute to war fighters, and in particular, the heroism of those that fought World War II, represented by the face of General Anthony McAuliffe. Behind General McAuliffe, we see tanks crossing the Bailey Bridge, symbolizing the ability to overcome and adapt at a moment's notice in the presence of adversity. In the background, a bird of prey represents the strength, endurance, and protective nature inherent in our American warfighters. Along the bottom edge, we read, dedicated to the great task remaining. Derived from President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, this mission is dedicated to protecting our warfighters deployed in harm's way and to the furtherance of that noble cause. Today's mission is also dedicated to ULA employee Don Kurtzy. Don began his career as a pad technician at Vandenberg Space Launch Complex 2, home of the Delta II rocket in 1998. Don transitioned to Slick 6 when construction began there to support future Delta IV launches. His responsibilities included ground system fabrication, installation, and certification. With Slick 6 fully operational following its first launch in 2006, Don spent the next 14 years supporting launches at all of ULA's launch sites here at Vandenberg as well as those in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Don will be remembered as a key member of the team and for his concern for his teammates and his community. His genuine kindness towards others, along with his excellent work ethic and expertise, will be remembered by all who knew him. So, uh, yeah, this is a tradition which NRO follows. They always dedicate their missions to someone uh, which they which have done some amazing work and yes today's mission was dedicated to him so uh hey roy uh welcome and watching from the space coast where i'll uh i'm waiting for the launch of artemis well 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 uh, it's a it's i don't have a good news for you roy because the sls is rolling back to the vehicle assembly building and it's not a technical issue here it's a weather issue there's a storm building up near the ksc and uh, uh, they will need to roll back the SLS so as to safeguard it from the storm effects. Uh, and yes, they also can't proceed with the September 27 launch now. And since it will be rolled back, the, the launch of the first Artemis is now pushed mm -hmm. back net uh, November, mid or end November. It's not happening in October. It's not happening in 27 September at all. So there are certain procedures which they need to go when the vehicle rolls, rolls back and then they come back again. So yeah, um, so now the net is around November. So let's listen in to Mission Director Colonel Chad Davis. 
T minus three minutes and counting things are looking great right now. Yes, Insomnia Gang is here and I'm also, um, I didn't know, but now I know I am also very much into Insomnia and I hate it, but that's how it is. So uh, when does it arrive at the moon? Tom, Tom, it arrives at the moon. It will take some time now. It's It will launch in November, so it will have to wait. So um, yes, Roy, I do. I, I uh, keep myself updated with most of the information and that was one of them so imagine if sls fell uh, down due to weather yes <laughs> although it won't happen there are hold down clamps there but still it's a funny thing to you know imagine so t minus two minutes and 20 seconds remaining okay so we wait a second we are still at t minus four minutes and counting. so i guess uh we'll have we are having some hold here let me just see uh What's the current update? Thirty five minutes away. Okay, so the launch has been pushed back. Let me just update my countdown here. The not like a big huge deal. Like pushed back to 25 30 minutes or so. Just to update it here. I'll have to wait. Uh, I'll have to um uh, like see or like why they have pushed their no minus 33 minutes done. yep md lc that one three md md i'll turn that one over uh to you for your dedication roger today's launch is dedicated to the memory of several <laughs> metro teammates william preston khan devoted his 48 year career in NRO's Office of Space Launch, enhancing our national security launch mission. Godspeed, Bill. Larry Loveland was a kind soul, friend to many, devoted husband, and proud father. For 29 years, Larry provided dedicated support to the NRO and was an expert in translating mission-critical launch requirements. Loved and missed by all who knew him, Larry is forever in our hearts. Dan McKaylee's 33-year NRO career included tours in multiple directorates where he provided dedicated mission support to the warfighter. Men and women across our nation who were deployed in harm's way returned home safely to their loved ones thanks to the intelligence delivered by the satellites that Dan kept in mission. For 35 years, Perry Fath went the extra mile to deliver premier mission payload capabilities, providing vital strategic intelligence to the White House and tactical intelligence to deployed warfighters. Perry was a brilliant engineer, laser-focused program manager and director who believed in a one-team partnership. Though gravely ill, he passionately and selflessly strove to fulfill his lifelong mantra, never compromise the mission. MD out. Thank you, MD. Soup Manson, uh, Mens Manson, yeah. Uh, it's not off. The stream is not off. Uh, it's uh, that the launch time is updated right now. So uh, there you have it. Uh, although we don't have like the actual reason why that did that happen. Um, I'm still trying to search it, but they have just um, you know told us that the launch instructor has uh, told us to push the. No, to have a new launch time and uh, still like uh, we don't know what actually happened there okay so uh, we will be uh, 
Okay, we will be extending this hold at T minus four minutes while the team completes post fueling this is Delta activities. Mission Control. Right. Activities are on track to support a new launch time of three twenty five thirty PM Pacific. Yeah, I have three uh, items that we discussed uh, much earlier that I uh, would like to close without briefs to you. Roger, LD net one. LD on one. MD net one. MD or CDC. Okay, first was we had two RLM exceedances as noted. Uh, this was tied to a uh, uh, temperature change in the uh, core uh, um, uh, engine inlet, and uh, this was attributed to a, uh, a helium bubble that uh, was uh, passed through the system. Uh, we have evaluated that, both uh, uh, the Denver team and R68. We have no concerns with that uh, uh, bubble being uh, there, and, and it's been passed, and we uh, recommend proceeding on that one. There you go. All right. So there was a certain issue. Uh, LC concurs. LD. LD concurs. MD. MD concurs. Oh, okay. Second. Second one was the uh, fill and drain valves on the core and starboard. We had uh, uh, issues with getting them uh, to cycle. Uh, we did uh, some uh, dis uh, discussion on that, and the uh, plan is uh, with the. Uh, cycles that we did perform at that time, we were confident proceeding with the rest of the count. Uh, we will do a standard uh, uh, cycle of them at uh, the new, what would be L minus 25 minute mark. And uh, assuming that that is uh, uh, successful, we will uh, recommend proceeding. We are recommending proceeding based on that. LC concurs, LD. LD concurs. MD. MD concurs. Okay, and the last one was also uh, a couple of RLM items. Uh, this was tied to the uh, turbine supply valve uh, pressure setting. This was also determined to be a uh, issue with where we were in the countdown versus where uh, RLM was monitoring. Uh, so a uh, uh, go ahead, not that. Not. So a condition that was uh, uh, not expected, but uh, completely understood. We will um, recommend proceeding on that one. Uh, it was only due to a delay in the count for today. LC concurs, LD. LD concurs. And MD. MD concurs. And uh, RLM, LC, that one. RLM, go ahead. I just want to verify with you the engine and inlet OTCs, they've uh, all been cleared. Negative. Uh, I was getting ready to do that, and then the uh, I received the, the the second set of OTCs, 863 and 866. Okay. So it interrupted me from clearing them. Right. Go ahead and clear those, and then after the L25, uh, we'll be able to clear the other two. Roger. All right. Things are <clears throat> looking good right now. Uh, so as you heard, there was some certain sort of um, some sort of helium bubble which caused the issue. So this helium bubble is like, you know, as I told you, there is a helium pumping which happens. Uh, Delta rockets okay. have launched many of the world's vital space assets. Let's take a look at the impressive legacy of the Delta family of rockets. Though first launched in 1960, Delta's story really begins in the mid-1950s with the development of the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. Named after the Norse god of thunder, Thor was created in response to a growing fear that the Soviet Union would beat the U.S. in the deployment of a long-range ballistic missile. The goal was to design a system that could deliver a nuclear warhead to a target 2,300 miles away, the distance between the United Kingdom and Moscow. On January 25th, 1957, the first Thor lifted off from the newly constructed Space Launch Complex 17 at Cape Canaveral. Following a series of early failures, the Thor team celebrated their first success on September 20th, 1957. In all, 59 Thor IRBMs were launched, with the last flight occurring in 1975. Thor began the transition from missile to space launch vehicle in 1958. 
On October 11th, 1958, America's newly formed space agency marked its inaugural launch when Thor Abel boosted NASA's Pioneer One on a mission to the moon, and NASA's long partnership with Thor was born. NASA and the Douglas Aircraft Company began development of the fourth and longest lasting Thor configuration in April 1959. Using a Thor first stage and a Vanguard second and third stage, Delta I lifted off on May 13, 1960 from Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 17. Though its first launch was not successful, the Delta team quickly pinpointed the failure. Three months later, delivered NASA's Echo 1 communication satellite to orbit. Following Echo 1, the Delta team racked up an impressive 22 successful launches. Led by Bill Schindler, the Delta rocket earned its industry workhorse moniker for rapidly establishing itself as one of the most reliable and versatile launchers. During the 1960s, Delta launch vehicles paved the way for the burgeoning communications industry, launched America's first weather satellites, and sent probes to explore our universe. AT&T's Telstar 1, the first commercial communication satellite, launched in 1962, and in 1963, SYNCOM 2 became the world's first geosynchronous satellite. TYROS, or Television Infrared Observation Satellites, provided the National Weather Service with humans' first view of the Earth's cloud cover. In orbit around the Earth, Moon, and Sun, NASA's Explorer satellites provided us with a deeper understanding of the solar wind, cosmic rays, as well as Earth's magnetic field and radiation belts. By the end of the decade, launch vehicle modifications, including the addition of solid rocket motors and an upgraded third stage, made it possible for Delta to orbit satellites 10 times larger. The 1970s was an international decade for Delta, as the manifest included scientific and communication satellites for several countries across North America, Europe, and Asia. Perhaps the most demanding challenge of the 1970s was the launch of the Earth Imaging Earth Resources Technology Satellite, later known as Landsat. The mission for the Earth Sciences community required major changes to the Delta propulsion and guidance systems. During the 1980s, Delta continued its reliable service to the communications, weather, and Earth imaging communities. As capable as the Delta rocket proved to be, Production came to a halt in the early 80s when national space policy dictated that the space shuttle be used as the U.S.'s primary launcher, signaling the end of the expendable launch vehicle. But in 1987, the Delta oh. team picked up where they left off and development began on a launch vehicle to support the Air Force's global positioning system. On February 14, 1989, Delta 184 began a new chapter in space launch history as it lifted off from Space Launch Complex 17, demonstrating an incredible feat. The Delta II had gone from development to launch in just two years. To accommodate the larger GPS satellites, engineers improved the Delta rocket in several ways. The fuel tanks were stretched, a new payload fairing was developed, and larger solid rocket motors were incorporated. The modifications resulted in increased performance and flexibility. Dude, that was something. By the mid 1990s, the Delta II is a good delivered the video. fully operational 24 satellite GPS constellation. And though it was developed for the Air Force, Delta again became a reliable partner to both NASA and its commercial customers. Over the course of its more than 20 year run, the Delta II has launched some of America's best known scientific and exploration missions. Plus four, three, two, we have main engine start. Zero and liftoff of the Stardust spacecraft. Liftoff of the Delta II rocket carrying the spirit from Earth to planet Mars. Liftoff of the Delta II. Ho, 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 ho. Just look at that. Journey to the center of the moon. On the commercial side, Delta II launched the Global Star and Iridium constellations, which brought satellite telephone communication to the world. Continuing its evolution to meet the growing demands of its satellite customers, the Delta team developed the more powerful Delta III. Though short-lived, Delta III doubled the performance of the Delta II. Of ignition, ignition and liftoff of the Boeing Delta III rocket. Stage systems looking normal. Engine burners keep burning normally in all six in partnership with the Air Force's evolved expendable launch vehicle program, the Delta team 
began development of the next generation Delta rocket in the mid-1990s. And we have liftoff of the first no, yeah. Delta IV rocket carrying the W-5 telecommunication satellite for Eutelsat of France. All Delta IV configurations begin with the common booster core powered by the RS-68A main engine. The Delta IV Heavy, with its three common booster cores, deliver our nation's largest missions to orbit. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket, carrying the NROL-32 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. Delta IV launch vehicles are produced at a 1.5 million square foot state-of-the-art facility in Decatur, Alabama. Processing and launch takes place at Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Space Launch Complex 6 at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Range safety arm light on. Right. Range ready. Ready. Water system ready. From its early beginnings as a weapon and deterrent through its transformation into a space launch vehicle, Delta has reliably supported our nation for more than 60 years. Delta's legacy as a workhorse continues today and is a testament to the persistence, dedication, and commitment of an enterprising team that has continually evolved the Delta rocket to support a changing world. Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket. Oh, just wow. It's like started from the bottom and now we are here. It was like so good. The video actually gave us like, you know, the history of how the Delta rocket and the Delta rocket family came into existence. And now this Delta, Delta rocket, rocket family is, is going extinct. <laughs> okay. Vulcan Centaur production begins with aluminum sheets expertly machined to remove... Okay, uh, before that, Baba Yada, let me just answer your question. Like, what is L and what is T? So, this L is nothing but a launch countdown and T is nothing but a test countdown. So, this is this is like, you know, as I said, there, will, there are two clocks, L and T, and T minus four minutes and holding is like, you know, a thing which happens and L is a, a countdown clock which actually just goes on. Okay, so um, uh, this T minus something is a test uh, countdown, which means everything which is tested is uh, there in that countdown, and that L minus is a launch countdown. So uh, the L minus, as they said, they are saying L minus 25 minutes, 20 minutes, or uh, 70 minutes are left. So that is the actual timer. Uh, and the T minus something is just a test one, which means they are testing all the things whether they are working correctly or not. And uh, yeah. So I guess that must answer your question. Nathan, is this a launch from? Yes, it is launched from uh, Vandenberg, uh, Vandenberg. Vandenberg, yes. And uh, this is the last launch of the Delta IV Heavy from the West Coast. Although it will be launching from the East Coast, there are still two launches are left. But the West Coast one, this is the last one. And yes, now you can hear how the Vulcan is manufactured to create the propellant tank domes the gore welder is one of several highly specialized welding stations in the centaur production process just down the aisle centaur 5's massive intermediate bulkhead is mated to its ultra thin tank once both propellant tanks are welded they're mated together to create the centaur 5 second stage once the propellant tanks are joined the 5.4 meter booster is sprayed with foam insulation before moving to final assembly. Twin BE4 engines are hot fired and then mated to Vulcan's thrust structure. With production complete, the booster makes its way onto ULA's rocket ship for its journey to the launch site. Meanwhile, at Cape Canaveral's Space Launch Complex 41, the water suppression system has been upgraded and tested along with other modifications, including new, larger fuel storage tanks. In the Vertical Integration Facility, or VIF, platforms have been modified to accommodate the larger Vulcan rocket. Following the eight-day journey to Cape Canaveral, the booster is offloaded and transported to the VIF, where it is lifted onto the newly constructed Vulcan Launch Platform, or VLP. The first Vulcan booster then travels a third of a mile to the pad for testing, followed by 2.7 miles to the Spaceflight Processing Operations Center, or SPOC, 
for additional testing. This launch site testing culminates with another trip to the pad, where the locks and LNG tanks will be filled and chilled to flight levels and temperatures. Wow. Okay. T minus 15 minutes and counting and uh, um, yes, um, right now things are looking good. We, uh, whatever issue we had has been solved, although there was some sort of a technical issue, the helium bubble, as they said, uh, that helium bubble is nothing but, you know, uh, I see locks too. I locks too. At this time, second stage locks is ready for terminal count. Roger. OS, LC. Go, LC. First step 1170OM, perform vulnerable data transfer to backup CCLS. Roger. Um, so yes, uh, right now it's T minus four minutes and holding. That's a built in hold. And we are L minus 14 minutes from liftoff. So uh, yeah, this is the L and T config. Uh, you can say this terminology and this actually dates back to the shuttle era this t minus and l minus thing actually came into existence in shuttle Last era month, also ula successfully launched sibers geo6 for the space force let's take a look at the highlights from that mission flight control perform launch on time verification Roger. Oh, yes, like Jason, uh, you can kind of say that. Uh, not so sure what helium bubble they were talking about, like uh, whether the helium uh, in the ground uh, support equipment or in the uh, rocket itself. So we'll I'm not so sure about that, but they detected that helium bubble. So kudos to them because uh, those bubbles are very, very hard to detect, but they were detected it. And it's not a big issue until and unless that bubble does not meet the engine. <laughs> If it meets the engine, then that's a very big issue. So if they are detected before that, now they can do some uh, troubleshoot to make sure that bubble goes away. So yeah. We have ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying Sibbers Geo-6 for the United States Space Force. that was something so yes uh we uh, not so sure about what helium bubble they were talking about right uh, um it was it for in the um fuel tank the hydrogen fuel tank or oxygen fuel tank minutes. so it's uh, <laughs> meq lc go initiate retract data logger just prior to the l7 pole roger okay the, these bots i don't know why the why these bots just come to my stream only where why they have like you know uh where from where they have acquired this channel name i just don't know go ahead guys uh per step 1180 would you like me to so uh tony brooks asked given the fire on some launches suppressed by water why not use an inert gas to quell fire on this rocket at launch uh well 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 okay so see it's not a thing to worry mm -hmm. about see why it's to solve it if it's not a thing to worry about so talking about the fire to suppress for this launch there is no need to suppress that fire all right uh, any damage which happens with the toasty looking thing which happens on the rocket that is all good uh, only the insulation which is on the rocket uh, is just charred up and it does not interfere with the working of the rocket so well they can kind of do that uh, they inert gas it, it would be like blowing the um, fire away that would be the thing uh, it won't solve actually the suppression of the system because uh, you to suppress the fire you need something to cut off the oxygen right um, 
that's how you can suppress the fire there are three things you which are needed you need to uh we cycled them uh 10 times we're uh in good condition we recommend proceeding all oh, right proceeding with count that is good all communications switch to channel one all personnel and visitors remain in present position until launch maintain operational silence in the lcc l minus 10 minutes rc verify saw radiation limits acceptable for launch verified Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint any time after the terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel one, identify their station, and briefly state the reason for the hold. OS, flight control, perform launch on time verification. Roger. OSM, verify the whole fire switch is in the proceed position. Ready to proceed. RLM, verify the red line monitor and event table are in the correct con configuration for terminal count. Verified. Hey, 22 fan, uh, 25 years of marriage this year. Uh, welcome to the Silver Jubilee Club. It's 25 years, right? Yeah. Um, welcome to that club, although I'm not, obviously. I'll minus nine minutes. So yeah, obviously I'm not uh, in that club. <laughs> Will happen someday, some year. But uh, yeah, congratulations to you. So yeah, uh, uh, what oh, I was oh, oh, all right. Viewers watching from Southern California may be able to see the Delta IV Heavy in flight. To get a closer look at this visibility map, check out at ulalaunch.com on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Yeah, take a screenshot and if you need live nearby, uh, just reference it before it lifts off. All uh, right. Uh, so yes, um, what was I saying? Um, uh, I just don't remember now. Uh, yeah. So to Tony, I was asking, uh, answering your question. So talking about this uh, water system, which is suppressed. It, the water system is there not to suppress the fire, but to suppress the sound. There, the vibration and sound is so much for a rocket launch that if you if you are nearby uh, standing near the rocket it would the sound and the vibration would just kill you this is just so much and uh, that is the reason why the water is a very good absorber of those vibrations and sound and uh, uh, hence that is used it's not to suppress fire but to suppress the sound and vibration we remain in the planned hold as launch preparations continue. In a few moments, launch conductor Scott Barney will poll the launch team for the final go to pick up the count. 27 engineers and managers are polled for system status and readiness to proceed. This is the final status check before launch for all Delta vehicle systems, ground systems, the spacecraft, and the U.S. Space Force Western Range. The vehicle system readiness poll includes electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Yep, Baba Yada. That's the term. Of the launch team. Water dilute system. Status check to proceed with terminal count. First aid systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Second stage systems, locks. Go. LH2. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. Com. Go. GC Cube. Go. Operation support. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Has gas. Go. ECS. Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. You have permission to launch. Hey, you go, Proceeding guys. With the count. ALC, Ye verified T0 is set for 22 colon 25 colon 30 Zulu. Verified. And this is happening. No, minus six minutes. We have a swing arm lock pins pull. Active. We are L minus six minutes from the launch. Everything is good. The ULA launch team and the NRO mission director are go for launch. From <laughs> T minus four minutes until launch, you will be hearing Scott Barney guiding the team through the final steps in the countdown procedure. 
Several critical activities occur in the final minutes before launch, including verifying fuel tank levels and pressures in the port, center, and starboard boosters, and the DCSS, as well as arming the flight termination system. At T minus 15 seconds, the launch table HBOs are ignited at the base of the vehicle to burn off excess hydrogen. At T minus 7 seconds, the starboard CBC engine is ignited. At T minus 5 seconds, the port and center CBC engines are ignited. Then, after seeing the Delta IV Heavy lift off, you'll begin hearing flight commentator Rob Kesselman providing launch vehicle ascent data. Okay guys, just hit that like button before this rocket lifts off and give some wishes to this rocket because you are gonna see some epic views when this rocket lifts off and just before that also. Who is ready for the fireball? which is going to happen and I am so excited for it. T minus 4 minute 30 seconds remaining. Everything is go for the launch. Weather is looking amazing and that is the reason why the fireball should not disappoint us. So yes, Sarki, we all are excited right now. Godspeed Delta 4 Heavy. Yes, indeed. Uh, T minus four minutes. We should see the countdown to resume just about now. Yep, there you go. T minus four minutes and counting. Things are looking great. The countdown clock has resumed and we are go for launch at 325 and 30 seconds Pacific. With liftoff approaching, we're going to raise the volume on our launch team so you can hear the final preps taking place. <laughs> okay, this is happening now. All right, this is going three minus uh, three three minutes thirty seconds remaining. Uh, all so this rocket. Let me just sum it up. This rocket is carrying NROL ninety one mission. This is a mission. It's like a keyhole uh, satellite keyhole telescope satellite so it's more of you can say a hubble telescope pointed towards the earth not so sure where it is where it is going but uh, we can assume it's kind of going to gto not so sure about it uh so we'll have to wait and see and now you can see the venting has stopped which means the uh, the valves have been closed and it the the tanks are now being pressed for the Internal. rocket to go into its terminal countdown and full thrust yay it's your first time Sergey. that's amazing you will enjoy it for sure then because this is the this is your first time but this is the last time you will see this rocket launching from Wellenberg flight pressure and flight level so uh yeah hey flying the bug welcome to the stream great to have you here too and t minus two minutes remaining uh we are i'm like whoa and guys if you are into the rocket launches and all the first timers please uh hit that subscribe button because we stream the launch and make some videos on those cool rocket launches space events and everything so uh, if you are into those things please hit that subscribe button 155 launch sequencer start and if you want to support me please do that it would mean a lot uh, by becoming a member or a Patreon of this channel. Link is down in the description. So, T minus 1 minute and 40 seconds SCM remaining. 137. It's happening, guys. All right. T minus 90 seconds. Get ready for the fireball. T minus 90 seconds. The launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and western range are go for launch. 120. And uh, always... Also look out for the suction which will happen just after the fireball is created. <laughs> if you remember the Saturn V, the suction used to happen. Some sort of similar phenomena happens here. T minus 60. One minute. Yep, T minus 60 so seconds nice. remaining. One minute. Rock report range status. Rock range green. Roger. 50. Okay, this is happening, guys. At T minus uh, 15 seconds, you will see the fireball uh, just rocking it up. T minus 40 seconds remaining. Second stage LH2 secure at flight level. Great. T minus 30. 30. Status check. 
Go Delta. Go NROL, 91. T minus 20, 19, 18, okay. 16.5. Rough ignition. 13, 12. 10. Test or start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. There you go. 5, 4. We have ignition. 2, 1. Left and lift off. Lift off of the last West Coast United Launch Engine Alliance Delta IV on. heavy rocket carrying Just NRL looked. 91 for the National Had Reconnaissance that. Office. Those three looking rockets. Vehicle have now begun the pitch over maneuver. Whoa. All three RS-68 engines look good at this time. We are having some great views of the onboard camera. Yeah, there you go. The tracking camera looks amazing. Those red plumes just do the justice for this mission. For oh, this rocket. Now throttling down at the partial thrust level. Everything is looking nominal right now, and yes, all and the three... We're hearing the voice the of Rob Kesselman thrust. providing launch vehicle ascent data. Good. Oh, 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 look at that. And you can uh, see the uh, speed of the plume, the, the thrust of the vehicle rocket engine. Vehicle is now three miles uh, in altitude, looking, five miles down Looking range. at the plume, the center one has like uh, diamond shocks, uh, and the other one does not have that, those diamond, uh, sorry, the, uh, the curve, not the diamond shock, the curve in the engines. Because the core one is actually at a lower thrust and the side boosters are actually at a higher thrust. Look good at this time. Vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Hey, contrails. Lock one, Delta four is now supersonic. Whoa, this is amazing. Just Port, look at starboard that. and center RS-68 engine parameters are within the expected operating parameters right now. That was an amazing view where you can actually notice the thrust of the rocket, the change in thrust of the rocket. Wow. Okay. This is the onboard camera view. T plus one, uh, almost two minutes now. Uh, the max Q, it has achieved the max Q and now we will be looking at the booster uh, shutdown and the separation the of the booster. second stage reaction control system pressurization valve has opened. Delta four now 130 seconds into flight, flying at an altitude of 19 miles, downrange distance of 14 miles. And yes, uh, Delta four has gone closed loop guidance. Hey, the spin, the roll the maneuver. Body rates are as expected. Three minutes remaining in the booster phase of flight. Delta four rocket weighs now just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of almost 5,000 pounds per second. Oh, okay, the arms look amazing. Until port and starboard booster engine cutoff. And all three RS-68 engines are showing good performance at this time. Vehicle body rates are near zero. 30 seconds remaining now until the port and starboard booster engines cut off. And two minutes remain in booster phase of flight, two minutes remaining until BECO. Strap-on boosters are now throttling down to the partial thrust level. Engine response looks good. We've had strap-on booster cutoff and strap-on separation. The center core RS-68A is now throttling back up to the high power level.
The upper stage lock system has begun the boost phase chill down sequence to begin thermal conditioning of the RL10 engine. One minute remaining in the booster phase of flight. And now the upper stage fuel system has begun the boost phase chill down sequence. All right, we are looking good right now. Hey, <laughs> things are looking amazing. Look at those views. Core oh, that... engine chamber pressure continues to look good at this time. So uh, we already saw those separation happening. So uh, this, this, uh, this, since this is a hydrolox. Uh, Rocket core booster is now throttling down in preparation for Pico. It is, uh, um, you know, it has a higher ISP, and that is the and reason we have why Pico booster engine cutoff. It is uh, kind of uh, long running. So we, we have, have stage separation, su successful separation of the first and second stages. Just look at that. We're seeing the nozzle just deployment begin on the upper stage engine. Whoa. Look at that expanding nozzle. That was amazing. And now uh, it must have started. <laughs> that expendable nozzle is just, just too good to miss out. And those flappy we little pre uh, ignition on the DCSS. Not little, but flappy big fairings, <laughs> which you can, which you could see there. Whoa, that is pretty cool. This is this Delta Mission Control at T plus 6 minutes and 30 seconds. We just heard flight commentator Rob Kesselman confirm the successful completion of the early phase of today's flight, and all systems continue to operate nominally. At this time, we'll end our live coverage. For more information about the Delta IV Heavy Rocket, please visit ulalaunch.com or join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Caroline Kirk. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. And before we leave you, let's take another look at the final West Coast Delta IV heavy launch. Roughy ignition. Look at that fireball. Just for start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, ho, 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 ho. 2, 1, Lift off. and. Liftoff of the last West Coast United Launch Engine Alliance Delta IV on. heavy rocket carrying NROL 91 for the National Reconnaissance Office. Hmm. Vehicle has now begun the pitch over maneuver. That was pretty amazing. It All lived up to the hype. Look good at this time. And uh, for that, you should like the stream, right? <laughs> that was indeed fun to watch. It was like the the it actually you know lived up to the hype which was around it so yes uh, that was the last delta 4 heavy launch from the Wind, uh, Wind, windenburg air force station and uh, we'll uh, so yeah this is the ext uh, extendable uh, nozzle which you just saw if you have never seen that i explained to you in the uh, this pre launch um, thing which i do i need to give it a name guys what, whatever I do, the explanation, do suggest me the, the names if you can. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, so um, this thing which uh, you just saw is this big. This is totally so big which you can't even imagine. I mean, um, let me just tell, uh, you know, show you once again, like how it works. So, yeah, so this is the normal engine, which we all know, like, which we all have seen the normal rocket engine. This is how it looks like more of more like a space shuttle engine, uh, the, the RS-25 engine. Yeah. But the thing is, this is just the upper part of the engine. This is, this is where the, uh, you know, beauty begins. So this is the stored configuration of the engine where this is the launch configuration in which it is stored and, uh, uh ready for the liftoff. So here, the that extendable uh, nozzle is just uh, shrunk down because otherwise the nozzle is just so big that uh, you won't be able to fit it inside a normal interstage. You need to have a very large interstage and then uh, that would not be cool enough. <laughs> so they have this uh, good and very unique uh, 
idea to extend the nozzle which you can see this is a normal one and this is when everything is extended and you just saw in the live feed also like how it expands extends and uh, that was pretty cool right and uh, yeah so this is how it looks like this is how it glows when it burns and this is the normal look like oh right uh so um uh omar says you deserve more views and serve you are very knowledgeable about these things thank you so much omar uh, means a lot if uh, what what uh, whatever little you can do you can uh, just subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss to any other updates and yes i try to make sure uh, i get myself um updated to the latest no uh, information so that i can give it to you i can I'll break it down for you guys in simpler and normal words so that you all can understand that rocket science is indeed not that hard rocket science is not rocket science exactly <laughs> i always say this and i always again say that uh, this this rocket science is easy rocket engineering is hard so rocket science actually if you have just high school physics experience if you have studied high school physics that's all you need to understand rocket science it is so pretty straight forward forward the 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 equations which you study which you apply in uh, those rocket uh, un understanding how the rocket engine works is pretty standard so yeah <laughs> that is one of the reason why i have so much interest in uh, uh, rockets because i initially also used to thought uh, that rocket science is just not my cup of tea but when i explored the field i actually uh, thought like you know i was thinking at that point of time like what have i missed 17 or like uh, when did i explode it 20 years now 19 years or 17 years of life i have wasted not exploring this field so uh, earlier you start the better okay now let's just have a look at uh, any other update that we have for Twitter and then we'll can wrap it up. Yes, exactly, Wildflower. Okay. Yep, indeed it was a very cool launch. And uh, uh yeah, so the, the if you are wondering like why uh did they cut off the stream? So it was at the request of the customer, which is the uh United Space Force uh, uh, and uh, they don't want their uh, uh, mission to go live because the orbital parameters could be just uh, you know um, what should I say Extra extracted from the feed, uh, uh, video feed which you don't want for a spy satellite yes this is indeed a spy by a satellite, a Hubble Space Telescope, but, but not a space telescope here. Hubble Telescope pointed towards the Earth. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, now let's have a, any other thing. Yo, that 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 was a scene. The extendable nozzle, right? Okay. Um, I don't think so. We have like any um, other update as such. Uh, okay. So there is one. We are excited to announce that we have been selected as a key partner of the team by Raytheon to produce the hypersonic attack cruise missile. Oh, is this a cruise missile? I thought like it was some sort of a rocket. <laughs> it's a very unique and advanced looking cruise missile. Okay. But I'm not so much into this defense stuff. But yeah. All right. So now I'm just doing my scrolling thing. So this is some sort of robotic apple harvester that can pick 30 apples in one minute. Whoa. That is something. All right. Um, uh, we do have that update though. Um, uh, regarding, uh, let me just have a look at that. Yeah, the SLS one. I've already told you about that. So, uh, there's that. The next thing which which is coming up is the uh, yeah, the fireball, the amazing fireball, which we can't miss, right? The next launch which is coming up is the Firefly rocket. Yes, that was delayed. Uh lot of times now it was supposed to launch i guess on 13th of september now it is be launching on 30th of september uh hopefully everything should go as per the plan for that launch now 
and everything else is looking good so that would be the last launch that i would stream on uh, for this month not on this channel for this month and then the other month starts and october i am telling you october is the october fest for the rockets because many many rocket launches are happening and before that i just forgot about the most important mission which is supposed to happen the nasa's dart mission is supposed to uh, actually test a planet defense mechanism and that is supposed to happen on 27th of september so i'll be streaming that too and lord i love those science missions and uh, i will be there breaking down all those science things and everything which is which the most exciting mission i would say the planetary planetary defense system which we are testing now on a on an asteroid trying to deflect it uh, and yes it is trying to deflect it and we'll have to wait and see if, if they are successful or not uh 27 september then that uh it is we will be uh coming back again here and uh we'll see that okay all right Okay, cool guys i think that should be it i can wrap it up now it's 4 a.m here okay and uh thank god it's sunday tomorrow so uh, i can sleep a bit but i do have some certain chores to look out for but all right uh we'll meet on 27th of september with the nasa start mission and uh, until then this is Pian Shroila. You just saw Rocket Gyan. Stay safe, stay healthy, and bye bye.